Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. I hope that you've had a chance to go to Gaia TV and check out my episode, which is the latest episode on Beyond Belief with George Nori, where we talk about shamanism and extraterrestrials. It was totally a joy to be on his program. I feel very honored. So please support Gaia, support me and go. And if you don't have the subscription, I have a link for you and I'll put it in the show notes so you can get a free 14 day trial. And what else is going on? Membership, membership. Yeah. So membership is live now on the YouTube channel. If you're listening to this on podcast or Spotify or one of the many, about 40 plus platforms this show is on, go over to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger, show up and sign up for membership because that is the place where you can to privately interact with me. We're going to do some group things, some sessions, have some of my guests stay after and work with you privately, answer questions. And I'm really looking forward to interacting with you. People are signing up. So make sure you do too, so you can have a great time showing me all your emojis. Uh, today, beautiful people on this show, you're going to be able to meet your star family. So important because I will be speaking a little later to Debbie Solaris, who is an ET contact, Ascension coach, and galactic historian. Dare to Dream won three talk radio Positive Change Awards, won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show. Welp Magazine named Dare to Dream one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year, and it is high ranking under self-improvement in Apple Podcasts. Also going on, about to open up, let's see, I'm going to say no to this, your otter by the way, is trying to get in. If you could shut that down. (laughs) Everybody's got otter now for Zoom and it likes to come in. Um, And we're saying no to AI today. Uh, So yeah, folks, in in, uh, very soon, July, five weeks. So every Wednesday, I am teaching a shamanic healing class. And I want to be really clear because I just, I've been interviewed a lot lately and the interviewee kept assuming I was teaching shamanism. No, way better. You're going to have an opportunity to receive a one hour healing session every week in this shaman course. Also check it out, the link in the show notes so you can see way more about the course and also how to register. Definitely get your seat before they get filled out. My guest today on the show and I are both speaking on the Galactic Origins Cruise to the Yucatan in December. I'm going to tell you more about it at the end of the show. We are both very excited, never been personally to the Yucatan and to many of the places they are taking us like Tulum, like Cozumel, like Honduras, Belize, and then when I tell you at the end who is speaking and presenting, so you get all of this for the cost of registering for your cabin. So the link will also be in the show notes, but I'll tell you more later. I am a book writing coach. I work with you and guarantee that your book reaches international bestselling status. And also I am a boutique uh, publicist. So I do PR work specifically for spiritual messengers. I only take six clients at a time. I never take more. So if and when there's an opening, you know, if you've been doing your job, your career for a while, uh, that's that's who is a good fit for me. And then I get you out there in a big way, including when I can speaking gigs. So yes, that's all the catching up right now. Now for the really yummy stuff, because Debbie Solaris is here. She's an interdimensional traveler and galactic historian. After a fateful extraterrestrial contact experience aboard an Arcturian starship, Debbie awakened to her true star lineage and higher calling. Through her ancestral connection with the Akashic Records, she's been receiving downloads of galactic historical information and universal spiritual knowledge ever since. 
Debbie feels it's a big part of her mission while here on earth to help people like you and me awaken to our own true divine selves and cosmic origins. You can learn more about her at De Debbie, that's D-E-B-B-I-E, -E, solaris.com. And with that, I welcome to the show, Debbie Solaris. Unmute yourself because you're gorgeous and we're so happy you're here today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be back. I think it's been like a couple of years since I was on, last on your show. So I think we were way overdue to, <laughs> to meet up again. So thank you for having me back. And you and I worked on a project together last year. Mm -hmm. And even though that project was executed, mm -hmm. I reserved your amazing video because you were channeling in that video. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the information was so incredible. So that's going to be released soon, too. So you will have yeah. been this year at least twice on the show. Twice, yeah, twice, yeah. Uh, so... Uh... So I guess we're going to talk about star seeds today, which is one of my favorite topics because I'm a star seed, you're a star seed, and a lot of us are star seeds. And uh, the question we often get a lot of times is from a lot of people is, where's my star origins? Where did I come from? You know, what star seed am I? You know, so hopefully we'll answer some of those questions today. Great. Thank you so much. Perfect yeah. segue. That yeah. causes me to ask for people who are watching, yeah. is everybody a star seed? I just want to add in this information. So as humans, we have mixed DNA. We are not just earth-based DNA. Mm -hmm. We have uh, some major contributions from other star beings. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in our real DNA genetic lineage. So that does that mean that everybody is a star seed or are some people star seeds because they came here with a specific mission and a star family? What I found uh, through, I would say, the thousands of Akashic readings I've done in the last 10 years is that I think a lot of us right now are star seeds, but not everybody is a star seed. There are some younger souls uh, here that maybe they've only had lifetimes on earth. Uh, so I wouldn't say across the board, you know, on planet earth, everybody is a star seed, but I would uh, definitely emphasize that there are more star seeds on the planet right now during this timeline than there ever has been in the history of planet earth, uh, probably even including Atlantis and Lemuria. Well, that's very exciting. Okay. Yeah. Hey, star seed family and tribe. That's very cool. Yeah. What about the Elohim? Are they considered a star seed race? Not really. The Elohim is considered to be the co uh, the co founders or the co creators of our physical reality here in in this galaxy and in our universe. So. Uh, so we sometimes will find people that have a connection to the Elohim, but I wouldn't consider it to be like a starseed race per se, because uh, they could encompass any race of beings. Um, so we could have, you know, Syrian starseeds that have an Elohim origination, or they're connected to the Elohim, or Larens, or uh, or Pleiadians, you know. So. It's kind of an over, more of an oversold group than a specific starseed race, if that makes oh, sense. That yeah. is so interesting. Okay. Yeah. And then when I, because I shared with you, I've been deep diving in this arena. And every time I deep dive, like yeah. there's more and more and more. This is a really expansive subject. Yeah. And when I read, I, I'll see Lyrans and information. When I read, I'll see felines and information. And so I'm curious. Are they the same, the felines and the Lyrans, or are they actually separate races? That's a really good question. They're the, I would say yes and no. So the felines are actually a group of beings that originated from a different universe. Mm. Yeah, so they actually were co-creators that came to this universe to start the whole genetic uh manipulation of physical beings on this you know in this in this galaxy uh, so yes there are feline beings that are considered the Laren feline beings but 
they are the physical representation of the etheric feline beings that came from a different universe. So I would say yes and no to that question, but uh, I would say they're probably like the Elohim where they're kind of an oversoul group that encompasses maybe different races of beings uh, that are associated with the feline genetics. Fascinating. Mm. Right now, Debbie, on planet Earth at this very interesting time, mm -hmm. are there specific star seeds we should be aware of? Star seeds maybe that are activated, that have really big missions, and yeah, that probably are out here listening to you right now and would like to hear about themselves to understand better. Gosh, there's a, um, I would say there's probably at least. 22 or even even more different starseed groups that have a representation here on planet earth and uh, there's the the ones that are the most common uh lyra and vega um so vega is actually part of the lyra system um and uh, so there's the white lyran race that were more the father god consciousness representation of that group and then the blue vegan people that were more the mother goddess consciousness, uh, humanoids. So they're represented very heavily here on earth. Pleiadian star seeds are represented very heavily. Uh, Syrian, I would say probably the majority of us physically have uh, some percentage of Syrian DNA since they were the most active in creating the human genome, uh, at least the earth human genome. Uh, Andromedan, although probably not quite as common, um, Orion, Arcturus. And then you get some uh, of the not so well-known races, uh, Apollonian, Pavilla, uh, Polarian, uh, you know, uh, groups from the four royal stars. Uh, and we'll talk about those a little later, but, um, and uh, Alpha Centauri, Beta Centauri, also Hadar, which is, they're also known as Hadarians, uh, Venusians, uh, Maldekians. I mean, we can go on and on, but um, there's quite a few races that are represented here. And Antares, so that is then the Mantis beings? Mm-hmm. Cool. Are yeah. they, so, I mean, I'm friends with somebody who channels them and identifies strongly with Antares. And I think you once told me that after I was Elohim, I went through, I went through the Scorpio Stargate to Antares. Mm -hmm. So I don't know mm -hmm. if I was ever manifested as a mantis. And mm -hmm. so the mantis specifically, are they the scientists and the healers? Yeah, they're, they're a little bit more, um, so unlike some of the starseed groups that we, you know, see that are represented on Earth that really played a big part in developing, you know, the Earth, uh, Earth civilizations or they, they, you know, impacted Earth in some way, the Ontarians were more the gatekeepers of this galaxy. So Antares is a stargate. It's one of the two major stargates, uh, the other one being a uh, Arcturus that a lot of us know about. Um, Arcturus is more the stargate of souls where souls get processed in between death and birth. Uh, Antares is a portal. So Antares is a portal that connects the higher dimensional realms of the Andromeda galaxy with uh, the Milky Way. And a lot of people don't know this, but the Milky Way was actually a baby galaxy that was birthed from the Andromeda galaxy. So when it separated from the Andromeda galaxy, Antares was created to be this portal that enabled these beings to pass, you know, to to the uh, to the Milky Way. And uh, it, um, it, it an Antarian um, star seeds are not, I would say, super common. Um, because they had a more hands-off approach on planet Earth. Uh, I think in the beginning of Earth's history, they might have had some colonies, but um, I don't see them heavily represented on planet Earth. So if you're an Antarian starseed, you're relatively rare, you know, because they're so high dimensional. They've uh, since ascended 
into very high dimensional realms. Well, I'm going to say 11th and 12th dimension. Uh, that I would say I would say it would take it would be very very difficult for one to uh, incarnate on Earth unless they were on a really special mission. Um, now I've had the good fortune to do Akashic readings for Ontarian star seeds. Uh, there are a few of them here on Earth that are here on very, very specialized missions, but um, I wouldn't say they're a common group. Um, but a lot of people love the mantis beings and uh, they're amazing beings. They're not, um, not all mantis beings are malevolent. Some of them are actually quite uh, high vibrational and uh, they tend to be, I would say a little bit um, more reserved, maybe, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't describe my friend as an Ontarian star seed. He's actually quite the opposite. Are uh, you talking about Tony Gazi? Yeah, I am. Yeah. He's, <laughs> yeah. He's adorable. Uh, he's, he, I think he must've been in other star systems because he takes on Orion nebula qualities and, uh, qualities from other star systems, but, uh, but yeah, they tend to be more analytical, I would say, um, very detail oriented beings. Um, and uh, maybe, a, like you said, maybe a little bit more scientific. Um, now, Tony does carry those qualities. I do notice that with him. He's very, very organized, which I, I think that is definitely an Antarian quality, but he has the big personality that, you know, the friendly personality that I think may, may, maybe came from one of his other incarnations. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, cool, because Tony Ghazi will be here on the show coming up. Um, I don't know what week or month, but he is coming up soon and he oh, will great. be channeling the mantis beings. So oh, wonderful. Yeah. And no. he's everything Debbie said. He does, he has a beautiful personality. So you'll get to experience that soon. And you know, this is interesting, Debbie, because I was recently I went to a retreat to work with a shaman. Mm -hmm. And it was a very a small group. Um mm -hmm powerful experience. And we, it was such a long journey to get into the mountains. We had to take a van together and there was about six of us in the van. So we really got to know each other on the drive up and back and great people, great conversation. And we got very extraterrestrial oriented in what we were sharing about. And this gal was asking me, well, do you know anybody who channels Orion? Do you know anybody who channels the Mantis? Well, luckily I could refer her to Tony, but Orion, I was like, God, no, I don't think I've ever seen that before. Have you? Debbie. Uh, yeah, I I think maybe that's because Orion was such a big melting pot of different types of beings that it's not like you can say, oh, yeah, I'm an Orion starseed because uh, you would have to channel a lot of different types of races, I think, to be specifically channeling Orion would be difficult because there's so many different representations of species and different beings that were, you know, existed in the Orion system. Orion's a huge constellation. It's, it's humongous. It has many star systems. Uh, a lot of people associate the belt stars with Orion, but it even expands beyond the belt stars. I mean, there's Rigel, there's Bellatrix, there's Betelgeuse, uh, Safe. So there's a lot of different star systems. And there's a lot of different types of beings that lived in Orion. Um, now, I do think there, Rob um, Gauthier, I don't know if you've had him on your show yet, but yes. Yes, uh, several times. yeah, I think he channels some beings from the Orion system, but maybe more the reptilian, the benevolent reptilian beings. But um, for somebody to say, oh, I only channel Orion beings, that would be kind of difficult because there's so many of them. But uh, it's kind of like when you watch the movie Star Wars, especially the original Star Wars movie, which uh, was, I think, came out in 1976 or 1977. Um, uh, um, I think it's called, oh, I can't remember the name of it right now. But um, it's, it, it's the one where they had the cantina scene where they had all these different beings that were in the bar and they were all drinking and carrying on. And then Han Solo and Luke uh, Skywalker were there too. 
Um, that's what I usually think of when I think of Orion. There's so many different types of beings there that it's just a big melting pot. Got it. Wow. That was an education for me. So you uh, spend time aboard an Arcturian starship. And I understand that these are your family. These are your people. Yeah. Are these your main people, the Arcturians? I would say they're my origination point, but like a lot of other star seeds, I've had incarnations in different star systems, you know, so I also identify quite heavily with Pleiadians. I've probably spent quite a few lifetimes there. I've had lifetimes in Lyra. I had lifetimes in Sirius, Andromeda. So I pretty much have been almost everywhere, it seems like. I, it's probably why I remember these places so well, because I've been there before. And since I became activated after that, you know, ET contact experience, it was like my memories came rushing through and I was like, oh, wow, I remember what this planet used to look like. And I remember, you know, the, the cities that were in this particular star system or what the civilization was like or their culture. So it's um, and also, I think having a regular connection with the Akashic records, particularly the galactic Akashic records, you're constantly downloading new and in, new information about different star systems. And so some of them were my own soul memories. And some of it was information that I picked up from the Akashic records where I was like, oh, wow, you know, this is um, this really makes a lot of sense because I always wondered why this particular race is like this or why they look this way or why they acted this way. The one other thing I noticed when I was doing Akashic readings was that um, there are certain traits and certain qualities that are associated with each star origin that pertains to their civilization maybe what their focus was on during that time. And also it pertains to their history. So maybe they went through some experiences where, you know, they went through an experience. And so they're dealing with things that pertain to some experience that as a collective, this group went through. Um, and just to give you an example, um, I'm just gonna use Lyra since you're very closely associated with Lyra. And I, I love Lyra too. It's kind of like my home away from Arcturus or, you know, I don't know, but, uh, well, I love, I love Lyra. I, I'm looking forward to the day when Lyra gets rebuilt, which is actually going to happen in our, um, probably in the near future. But, um, um, but basically um, what happened with Lyra is that they, um, the people that the souls that originated from Lyra or souls that had incarnations in Lyra, went through a very catastrophic event. So they went through this massive war. So the Lyrans went, in, uh, went into war with the reptilian beings from Draco. And, the, and this was because the Draconians just wanted to take over their system. They just thought, you know what? We don't care that there's beings that live there. We just want to take over their system because they have, um, uh, you know, they have uh, resources that we wanted, you know, and we're, we're that kind of race, you know, their services self kind of race. Uh, so they went into war with the, the Lyrans and, uh, um, and believe me, those lion beings, they fought valiantly. I always, always see the lion beings that, you know, they really try to, um, they, they really try to defend, you know, their system. Uh, and, uh, but, um, because of this, you know, because they went through this catastrophic event, um, they lost their planets. You know, a lot of their planets got destroyed during the wars. And so what I see over and over again with Lair and Star Seeds is that they they go through certain lessons, um, even in this lifetime, where they're this, the lessons they might go through might be oh, I'm having to do a lesson on betrayal or have to do a uh, go through a lesson of losing everything and then having to start all over. Um, or they may even take on some physical issues. Uh, the most common one I see is usually uh, autoimmune conditions with uh, Lear and star seeds. When Lear and star seeds start off having an incarnation on earth, they're very... Uh, 
Um, they're very hardy. You know, they, they have really excellent genetics. But what happens is they go might go through a period of stress, like maybe they go through a divorce or, you know, trouble at work or something, you know, something stressful happens. And then all of a sudden they start developing fibromyalgia or lupus or uh, chronic uh, fatigue syndrome or something to the, or, or even rheumatoid arthritis. These are conditions I see very commonly with certain larynx star seeds. Um, and so, you know, so what this is indicating is they need to work through something, you know, so a lot of times once they do the inner work, um, so it's not just taking care of the physical symptoms, but it's also doing the emotional inner work. That's when some of they are able to resolve some of these issues. Um, so that's just an example of one star group, but, uh, but I see this with a multitude of other star groups as well. Ooh, that was super fascinating. And thank you for that explanation. Um, I've always been curious, like why were the Lyrans, you know, the Lyrans were warned. Why mm -hmm. didn't they, I asked Jerry Sargent yesterday, he was yeah. on the show. Why, why didn't they heed these people? And yeah. his, you know, I would love your input about that because it it's so confusing. I understand these were very peaceful lion yeah. beings. Yeah. However, they were being warned these draconians are not here for good. They may be presenting themselves as friendly, but mm -hmm. they're going to wipe you guys out. That is their intention. So why didn't they do what was necessary so that wouldn't happen? Well, you have to keep in mind that Lyra existed as a civilization for thousands and thousands of years. And these beings lived in paradise planets. They didn't experience any adversity. You know, they were, they lived in, you know, in complete unity consciousness with each other. So because they, and I, and I do believe that maybe after a time they got a little complacent, you know, they, maybe they, thought, you know, hey, things are good. Things are always going to be good. So there's, there's a lesson in that, I think, for even Earth humans, like, you know, don't let your guard down, you know, even if things seem like they're good, you know, you never know, you know, what adversity might be around the corner, you know, or, um, and also that maybe not to blindly trust, um, you know, uh, certain beings that present themselves in a certain way. Um, I think the Lyrans were very open hearted, very childlike in their approach to life and their approach to their civilization. And so when the Draconians reached out to them and said, hey, you know, we want to be your friends, they just took them at face value. Maybe there was some suspicion, but they, they took them at face value and they got bamboozled as a as a result of it, you know, and they they ended up paying a very heavy price. They lost their planets, they lost their star system. And even today they still go through, you know, Laren star seeds still go through, through some of these lessons. Uh, and it's uh, difficult, but at the same time, I think once they transcend these lessons, uh, they do really, really well. They're able to heal others, they're able to make a huge impact, you know, so, um, I also had past lives in Lyra and, uh, I, I went through a period where I went through this, this health crisis where I had a lot of health issues. And once I started healing some of my past lives from Lyra, that was when I was finally able to make some progress with my health recovery journey. So I'm, I'm a prime example of, you can see the other side of it. So you're not doomed to have this autoimmune condition, you know, forever. You can at least manage it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Right. You have a big mission. So I'm really glad you're still here. Yeah, no. Doing well. I'm happy to be here too. So, yeah. And so, was the planet actually, so this is a Vega constellation, Lyran planets, if I understood you correctly, did the draconians take those planets over or, with the war, do they actually end up destroying the Lyran planets? My understanding is that I think they took them over for a while just to strip them of their resources and then they destroyed them. It was horrible. I mean, it was just really a, a waste and horrible. It makes me angry still when I think about it. 
It's just like, why, <laughs> why would you do that? And I think they did it out of spite. I think they were just like, you know what? Um, we don't want the Lyrans to ever come back, you know, so we're going to destroy their planets. I mean, it was just horrible. Um, and they stripped the planets of all the resources. I could just, own, when I think about it, it's just like my, my blood boils because it just makes me so mad, you mm. know, because I remember how beautiful those planets are. Um, if I had to describe what they were probably like, um, a lot of people have watched Avatar. Mm. Uh, yeah, the, the when you see the planet, uh, which I think what they called it Pangea and the Avatar movies, that's what the Laren planets were like. And they were just stunningly beautiful. And... You know, it's just like, but I do believe it's going to be rebuilt. That's what I saw in the records is that. Yeah, can you say a little bit about that? Like, yeah. what does that mean? Um, so what that means is uh, once I, I think it was quite a few years ago, I was doing a reading for somebody and she was going through this massive lesson uh, with her twin flame. Her twin flame was from Vega. She was from one of the other lunar and star systems and uh, they were going through this twin flame journey together. And uh, I was looking in her records and I saw, I think you're going to be returning to Lyra in the future. And I saw that Lyra was going to get rebuilt. Like they were going to um, recreate the planets or the realities or dimensions or something. Mm. And I just started crying during the reading. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh, uh, Lyra is getting rebuilt and you're going to be a part of it, you know? And, uh, she was, she cried too, cause, um, she felt a really deep connection to Lyra and, uh, um, she was one of my original, uh, star seed clients, uh, way back when I was starting doing, to do these readings. And, uh, um, I, uh, and you can listen to that, uh, to that reading, it's actually on my YouTube channel. It's the uh, the Lyra Vegas Twin Flame connection. I don't remember the exact title, but um, it's one of the, the the very first ones I produced. But uh, but just how amazing that is! And then I started seeing it over and over again in the records. Like, oh yeah, I think that's going to be the final piece of healing in our our, our galaxy is when they rebuild this system back to its original glory. And uh, I, I do believe that a lot of us are going to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. So um, so even after we get Earth on track, you know, this is not the only <laughs> the last frontier. We're, we're going to be doing some work in uh, in Andromeda and then also in Lyra and Vega. So uh, we have a lot to look forward to. Okay. Wow. Beautiful. Nobody's probably heard that before. That's big news. Yeah, so, no, I'm excited. I just like, like I said, I have great love for Lyra. Um, I, uh, that was actually as an Arcturian being, that was my original, um, my original uh, mission was to work with the Lyrans. So I have great love for the Lyrans and I would love to see their system come back. So yeah. Um, but thank you for that. Yeah. And thank you for your love of us. That's so yeah, cool. Yeah. Let's talk about the Arcturians. Let's start with them. And we're going to yeah. briefly try to go through as many as we can. Yeah. Are there characteristics of Arcturian star seeds on Earth? And do they have a purpose while they're on Earth? Arcturian star seeds, uh, I'm speaking as one myself. Uh, we tend to be multi-talented in many different areas. Uh, so unlike some star seeds that are very specialized, um, I would say probably uh, Andromedans tend to be more specialized in, in what they do. Uh, uh, Arcturian star seeds, we're very scientific, but yet at the same time, we're very creative. So a lot of times what you see with an Arcturian star seed is that um, they have a creative bent to them. So maybe they're artistic or maybe they like to play music. Um, I even know some, some Arcturian star seeds that write vegan cookbooks. I mean, I mean that's their creative outlet um, or they're an interior designer, but then they're also very analytical and very, uh, 
And they tend to be, I would say, spiritual guides and teachers. That's what the mission I see over and over again with Arcturians is, um, yes, they're very technical. You know, a lot of them might work in the IT field or they might be a scientist or a doctor, but they're also uh, very highly spiritual. So what I see a lot of times with Arcturian starseeds is that usually they're on this massive big mission, you know, to expand consciousness. And they might do it through um, maybe, you know, speaking in public or maybe uh, teaching or maybe they do a podcast or, you know, something to that nature. Um, so um, with Arcturian star seeds, I think the lesson for us is not to fall into negativity. Um, Whereas with the Larens, you know, their lesson is not to be true trusting, you know, with the Arcturian star seeds, I think sometimes it's easy for us to fall into anxiety or into negative thinking, um, at least as star seeds, not as Arcturian beings. But, um, and then the kind of the health issues we might end up having would be, uh, more endocrine related. So with thyroid issues or cancer or uh, parathyroid, I see a lot of parathyroid issues with Arcturian star seeds. Um, so, um, so we also deal with some health issues. Um, and then until we, you know, transmute those through some inner work. Um, and, uh, a lot of Arcturian star seeds are also healers. Um, a lot of them are more psycho spiritual healers. So we see a lot of Syrian star seeds that are very much physical healers. They do work with energy, but more on a physical level. With Arcturian star seeds, we work more on an energetic level. Um, and so, uh, so it's more of a psycho spiritual type of healing. Uh, so you see a lot of Arcturian star seeds that might do hypnotherapy or they might heal um, on, on an interdimensional level, you know, on multi, multi, uh, maybe they're uh, clearing, uh, you know, clearing old karmic patterns or, or they do a lot of shadow work. So, um, so that's the Arcturian mission. Okay. What about the blue avian star seeds? What is their origin and what are their characteristics and purpose on Earth? Uh, blue avian is another one of those groups that, like the Ontarians, is not a common starseed group. Um, I, I have had the great uh, honor to do a few readings for people that have avian genetics. And uh, like the feline beings, they originated from a different universe and they were more frequency management groups. So the, the feline beings or the, the etheric lion beings were more the, uh, the co-creators of physical reality, whereas the avians were more, uh, they were more the frequency maintainers, you know, so they maintain the electromagnetic frequencies of each system. Um, and so I would say that was their main purpose. Um, now, th these beings, um, when they do incarnate as a star seed on planet Earth, um, their qual their qualities are similar to an Andromedan being, um, where they're a little reserved. They kind of like to do their own thing, um, you know. So they don't fall in as part of the crowd. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more. Um, uh, energetically aligned. So they might work with energy medicine or, or some sort of energy healing. Um, if they do, um, any kind of, I would say 3d type of work, it's usually very technical. Um, but, um, but once they align with their spiritual mission, it's usually, uh, they're healing earth grits or they're healing energy is what they usually end up doing. Uh, more often than not, they like to work more with the environment than they do one-on-one -on -one work. Uh, Syrian starseeds love to do one-on-one -on -one work. Um, uh, avian beings, if they do energy work, they like to work more on a mass scale. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times they like to travel to different parts of the planet and do 
grid healing or grid work. Mm. God bless them. We need them. Yeah, we and do. Then we've got blue ray star seeds. That is different than the blue avians. These are blue rays. Mm -hmm. What is unique about them and why are they needed on earth at this time? Why did they come in to be light workers? Yeah, that's a good, um, and uh, if you're interested in blue rays, I would say Shakina Rose, um, who is an amazing, I don't know, sound. <laughs> she's, she's an amazing light language sound healer. Um, and she's based out of Sedona. She, I kind of consider her the, uh, the foremost expert on blue rays because she talks about them a lot. Um, but blue rays are more generational. So, and it can encompass a number of different uh, starseed origins. So a blue ray is more of an older generation. So these are the first star seeds that started coming in during this timeline. So, uh, so these were the folks that were what Dolores Cannon would call uh, more the first waivers, um, which you and I are both first waivers. Um, so I think you and I both also fall into the blue ray categorization. Um, so blue rays are highly sensitive um, and they're more, I would say foundational. So they're more laying the foundation for the ascension process rather than being a system buster or a system builder. So what they do is um, they're more of a healer, a guide, or a teacher, um, uh, but we're not here to create new systems or to break down old ones, if that makes sense. Uh, and we're not necessarily here to be activists or truth tellers. I mean, we tell truth in our own way, but it's not like, okay, I'm going to be uh, on the disclosure path and I'm going to uh, you know, be become an activist for disclosure. That's not our mission. Um, for a blue ray, a blue ray, they have more of a gentler energy. Um, so they came in to lay the foundation for the ascension process during our timeline, but they're not necessarily, I would say, um, uh, uh going to be continuing. Um, so after this lifetime, a lot of the blue rays their mission here is finished, if that makes sense. Oh, when uh, you say their mission is finished, you mean they probably will not be coming back to Earth? Earth, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, very interesting. I wondered yeah. about that a yeah. lot. Because um, a lot of times when I did readings for people that were born between 19, late 40s through the 60s, a lot of times I'll, I'll see like, gosh, I don't see you coming back to earth. I think you're pretty much done after this life. And a lot of times they're really happy. But when they, <laughs> it's um, a dense place. Yeah, it is a heavy, kind of a hard. And I think a lot of that is because some of us may have had prior lifetimes here. So we're kind of preparing, you know, the stage for this. This is, you know, considered to be the apex lifetime. And so, um, so for us, you know, it's kind of like, well, okay, I'm going to get Earth to the fifth dimension and that's it. You know, I'm done here. You know, so. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we're going to pass it off to the second waivers and the third waivers. They can they can create new Earth. Um, but And we'll, ha we'll see new Earth too. I mean, it's not like we're never going to see the ascension. We're, I, I do believe ascension is going to happen during this lifetime. It's actually happening now as we speak, but... Um, but we're not going to be here, you know, mucking around with Earth 500 years from now. So that's what I mean by we're not coming back. Um, so it's kind of a gentler energy. And I think we had to have a gentler energy to deal with all the conformity and the pro heavy programming that was going on during the 40s and the 50s and the six, even the 60s, you know, it was just kind of like, Oh my gosh. I mean, I just remember growing up, you know, there was nothing out there on uh, metaphysics or spirituality. I mean, if we, you were lucky, you could might find an astrology book in the occult section of a bookstore, but it wasn't common knowledge back then. That is so correct, man, because not that I grew up in the forties, but I will say that when I grew up, that was the big gift in my family was books. Yeah. And 
when I went to the bookstore, that's what I would ask for as a little kid. Like it was already in me. Can I have a tarot book? Can I have an astrology book? I was so into all of that, but they me didn't too, have <laughs> the plethora that they do now. Like unreal yeah. what's available to us. So many levels, you know? Oh, I know. There's so much out there now. I mean, we're, we're so fortunate to be living in these times where there's just so much information out there and so readily, you know, so easily accessible, you know, just through our phones, you know, just, uh, or our computers, you know, so it's just uh, really, but yeah, back in the day, you know, so, yeah, I think you were born in the 60s too. I was born in the 60s. It was just like, wow, there's nothing, nothing out there, nothing. It was a, a, a spiritual wasteland for decades until just recently. Yeah. So we deserve mad props for holding up and being gentle through all of this to get yeah. y'all here. So be good you know to what? us. We were the ones that were the first ones asking questions, though. We were the first ones that were saying, there's something wrong with this reality. This yeah. is and feeling so different. Like when you talk about the programming that we came into yeah. in those decades and then going, what? corporations and then with what a woman's role was and a man's role and what you couldn't couldn't do and you could only work here and I mean and we all felt so different we knew something else existed yeah, exactly we're being told you know that's very strange if you think yeah. like that yeah no it's uh no, thank goodness things are changing. Um, so you have any more Starseed groups you want me to talk about? Yes, here's one that I had not heard of before I started doing this massive deep diving. Yeah. And it's called Fomal Hout. I think I have to spell it F O M A L H A U T. Fomal Hout. Is that right? Fomal. Yeah, Fomal. Fomal Hout. Yeah. Yeah, that is actually the biggest star in the Aquarius constellation. So it's one of the four royal stars. Um, so Formahalt is in Aquarius, and then you have Regulus, which is in Leo, and then uh, Aldebaran, which is in the Taurus constellation, and Antares, which we mentioned earlier, is also one of the four royal stars because it's in the fixed sign of Scorpio. Um, so each of these star systems were considered to be the four royal stars because they're the stability stars. They can they create stability within our galaxy. So the zodiac wheel is kind of like a bit the backbone of our our galaxy. And then the, the the four fixed signs are the stability signs. And so these uh, and you see representations of these uh, four fixed signs, you know, all throughout, you know, biblical lore and uh, many different, uh, I would say, uh, different uh, schools of thought. But uh, formal halt was, um, is associated with Aquarius. And so each of these four stars are associated with an archangel. So formal halt is actually associated with Gabriel, Archangel Gabriel. So formal halt uh, star seeds, and like I said, this is not real a common star seed group, but occasionally we'll see them pop up. Tend to be great communicators. So a lot of times they're in media. A lot of times they're working with communication. Maybe they're writing blogs, or they're doing podcasts, or they're doing different types of communication. Um, maybe they're in marketing. So that's kind of the, the focus of a formal halt, uh, star seed, um, which is different from Aldebaran. Aldebaran, which is in Taurus, they're more the spiritual warriors, you know, so they're more space explorers, you know, they, they're associated with Archangel Michael. So they they take on more of the masculine component, um, so uh, whereas Gabriel, I think, can kind of plays a little bit more feminine, perhaps, I don't know. But uh, but yeah, it's kind of interesting to see, um, you know, these different star uh, people that are being represented nowadays. Um, uh, Regulus is another one of those star systems you don't see pop up a lot in star seed um, origination but when you do see it it's like oh okay they represent the fire element and 
you know, they, they're also a Royal star. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe they had some sort of particular mission that's associated with, uh, that particular system. Um, but yeah, for Mahal, that's an interesting star system. <laughs> yeah, that's a new one for me. Also, the Hadarians, those were new. For yeah. Me as well, and you mentioned them earlier. What would you say about what makes them indigenous to Hadarians? What makes them unique and apart from the other star seeds? That's actually a group I've had a little bit more dealings with. Um, Hadarians, uh, so they came from Beta Centauri. So Beta Centauri is a little further out than uh, Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is located very close to planet Earth. Beta Centauri is like, I think, um, 150 to 200 light years away. So they're fairly far away. Um, they also went through a lot of trauma in their history where they got taken over by kind of a dictatorial or di di a, a dictator type of being that took over their system. So they were forced to leave their system because they were just being persecuted. Um, and so they ended up uh, coming and having ho uh, colonies on planet earth. These beings are extremely sensitive, um, even more so than I would say Pleiadians. Pleiadians are also very sensitive star, star groups, but Hadarians, because they went through so much trauma, they're they come in as representing love consciousness. These are these are um, star seeds that are all about love and relationships. They have a focus on relationships. They have a focus on not so much necessarily just romantic relationships, but relationships in general. And so that's what they came here to heal is relationships. And so. They represent more the flip side of the Alpha Centaurians. And Alpha Centaurians are very masculine. They're very kind of divine, masculine oriented, very analytical, uh, techn technical. Hadarians are quite the opposite. They're sensitive, they're emotional, they're maybe a softer personality. Um, and so, um, so sometimes, you know, when you see um, particularly uh, people that are born as males during this lifetime that might have an Hadarian origination, they present themselves very feminine, okay? Um, they might present themselves having very strong feminine qualities. Uh, and on the flip side, you know, people that have had incarnations as an Alpha Centaurian, they might represent themselves as more masculine, even though they might be, you know, female in this life. So, uh, so we're all kind of going through all these different patterns and experiences, and it's always so interesting. But yeah, Hadarians had it kind of tough. I I do hope that one day, like the Lyrans, they'll regain their star system, and I do believe they will. But um, uh, and hopefully they'll be able to return home. Beautiful. Well, before we go into the next one, and I do have a next one. Yeah. I just have to say this. I just have to say this. Yeah. So I said this on Coast to Coast, when I was being interviewed by George Nori, and I'm feeling it again, yeah. hence it is coming up. So George had asked me, and frankly, I don't remember, to be perfectly honest, but whatever yeah. question he asked me, I didn't actually know the answer. Yeah, It did so, say, my friend Debbie Solaris has spoken about this, and I'd like to quote her, because mm -hmm. you had already spoken to it so well. Mm -hmm. And I prefaced it by saying, she is a virtual galactic wikipedia and he laughed and he of course of course you've been on his show a few times you've been on uh gaia tv with him so many times he of and I, course, was, I was also on coast to coast with him too so yeah you were coast to coast so he is this intimate experience of your it, you can't even call it fast it feels beyond that so we both had a a loving reflection of you and he also said very nice things and we agreed like it's incomprehensible. I need to pause here and mm -hmm. reflect on that. This may be very normal for you, mm -hmm. but because I've had several experiences with you now, mm -hmm. I am, I'm kind of blown away. And I know you said, oh, I've lived many places. And that seems lovely and humble, 
But really, what is this for you? How do you perceive with such detail at the level you do? There is nothing I have ever asked you, you have not been able to in depth respond to. So please, if you don't mind, like pull back the curtain just a little so we can get to know Debbie and what is this that happens? Well, when I was on board the Starship with the Arcturians, so when I had my ET contact experience the first time around, uh, so I asked the Arcturians, like, why me? I'm nobody special. I'm just you know, a health inspector for the local health department in Colorado Springs. And, um, and they told me that I came from a long line of Arcturian scientists, ambassadors, and historians and that I had worked with the Akashic records for many, many uh, lifetimes, that my, even my Arcturian uh, extraterrestrial lineage, I have, I've been connected with this information for millennia. And uh, I, I'm also connected with uh, a system called Altair, which is uh, it's another one of it's it's not really a starseed group. It's more of a galactic uh, council meeting place. Um, it's part of the Aquila constellation, which is actually the Eagle constellation, which is actually located very close to Scorpio and Sagittarius. But um, so I, I do believe I've been doing this work for millennia, and that's the reason why I incarnated here on Earth was to. Uh, bring this information forward so we all can, can reconnect with our star origins and can remember, like, you know, our history as humanoid beings or as beings, you know, just as souls um, goes way beyond Earth, you know, and I'm just, I, I feel humbled and actually I feel honored and humbled that I get the opportunity to share this information and a lot of times it's like, almost like I'm channeling it. It's like, I don't need, sometimes I don't even know it. It's like, I just channel the information and then I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess I do know that. Um, and uh, so it's kind of interesting how that all plays out. Um, some of it is information I've seen before in the records, um, but sometimes somebody will ask me something and I'm just like, oh, I don't know. And then I was like, I'll start channeling the information. I'm like, oh my gosh, I do know this. Um, so, but thank you for saying that. That's really kind of you. Um, I don't really have any ego around it. I really, I, I really feel just like an um, honor to be a conduit for this information, and I'm happy to share it as much as I can. And I see you everywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. when I first got to know you, you know, you were at a pretty decent level, and yeah. I was so excited to know you and to even get a reading with you before you got so huge. You had to start teaching other people to, yeah. you know, you have still classes. If folks are interested, you go on her website, DebbieSolaris.com, and you can become, uh, I don't know that you call a facilitator, but you can become a, an, a galactic Akashic record reader. Reader, yeah, reader. Well, yeah. Everybody wants this right now. It's a great yeah, way yeah, of living. Is. So Deb got so huge at, that she had to stop that. But, you know, there is no end to the, the tail of this comet at this point. Because I know it's, it's endless. You are being asked. I, do, I learn new things everywhere. every day. I I do learn new things every day. It's it's amazing this journey that we're all on. That you know we have access to the galactic records now, and we can access all these these new different nuances of information that we can just you know incorporate into our present lives. And and that's the beauty of it is that it's not just oh that's interesting that happened in the past and oh that's not that nice. It's like, oh, wow, this is information that's really helpful, life changing. I can incorporate it in, uh, you know, my day to day life. And I've seen people change their lives with this information. That's why I'm so passionate about it. Because, oh my gosh, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So I hope people who are listening, either, you know, your galactic lineage and you're mm -hmm. saying, oh, that's important for me to hear or to know, or yeah. maybe this is getting you attuned with some of your lineage. So mm -hmm. let's go into the Maldec because they were also mentioned earlier, the Maldec star seeds. What makes them different? And what oh, gives gosh, them- Maldec, oh my gosh. Um, 
So I call I call Maldek the Australia of our solar system. <laughs> so let me at first preface that by saying that Maldek was the planet that used to exist between Mars and Jupiter, which is now the asteroid belt. So everybody wonders why is there an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter? Because it used to be a planet that blew itself up. Um, so the Maldekians were beings that were ousted from Orion. So it wasn't just the Australians that were, or the, the I guess the England used to send their, um, their the criminal prisoners. Element, right. Yeah, their prisoners, prisoners and their criminal element to Australia. The Orions used to do that with some of their criminal elements. So they sent their criminal element to Maldek. And, uh, and so you had like all these really aggressive people that were living in this one planet. So needless to say, there was a lot of conflict on Maldek. And, uh, and I wouldn't say all the Maldekians were evil or bad. I don't want to paint that because I've done readings for Maldekian star seeds and a lot of them are very, very good people. Um, they tend to be extremely loyal. Um, uh, so when they're loyal to something, they're really loyal to a fault, um, even in relationships, you know, where sometimes they'll be your ride or die kind of person, friend, you know, that is there through thick and thin, even though you're thinking sometimes like, why is this person still hanging around, you know, but um, the other thing about them is that um, they do seem to be more, less spiritually oriented than say, a Pleiadian star seed or a Hadarian star seed or a Venusian star seed. They tend to be very matter of fact. A lot of them work in engineering or the IT field, you know, so they, they're attracted to more technical type of fields. Um, but um, and what ended up happening to the Maldekians is they went to a civil war and they blew up their planet. I mean, it was just like, and so those souls ended up reincarnating on planet Earth or Mars and planet Earth, I would say. But um, but they ended up, I think, becoming incarnating into Atlantis mostly uh, and influencing, you know, the Atlanteans. But uh, but yeah, these beings, um, they had an interesting history and they have interesting life lessons, I think, to go through. Uh uh, what happens to a lot of them is that they end up waking up and then they, they do this deep dive into spirituality because that's what they came here to do is to integrate that part of themselves uh, because they didn't have the opportunity to do that in their previous lifetimes in Maldex. So, uh, so yeah, it's an interesting group. Um, and like I said, not a very common starseed group, but definitely one that I do see from time to time when I did Akashic readings. You mentioned uh, some of them had populated on Mars. And so is there a Martian starseed? Does that exist? Yeah, to a certain extent. Um, most of the Martian starseeds came from other places. So they weren't necessarily, oh, they're, my origination is Mars. Um, they might have come from Orion, or they might have come from Maldek, or they might have come from some other star system. Um, so it's kind of like Altair, where Altair does, is not really an origination point. It's more of a meeting place for massive galactic councils, you know, so... Um, so not all of these systems, I would say, would be an origination point per se, but it might have been some place where we had a past life, you know, so, um, so sometimes I'll see somebody that maybe was Arcturian origination, but they had a mission in Maldek, and then they had a mission in Mars, you know, so, or they might have been from Sirius or Orion originally, so, uh, um, so that's kind of the interesting part about some of these uh, planets and systems is that um, uh, they might be kind of like uh, the United States where there was a melting pot, you know, where there was different beings that resided there. Right. Especially New York is what I was thinking when you yeah, said yeah, this. Yeah. Very yeah, much where everybody arrived on Ellis Island and started a new life. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And Mintaken, another one that I hadn't previously been aware of. Where are they from? And what are their, their characteristics? Mintaken, M-I-N. Yeah, Mintaken. Very sure. familiar with, I, I actually had a past life there. So I know Mintaka quite well, quite well. I love Mintaka. It's one of my favorite, it's actually my favorite Orion system. Um, so Metaka as a star system is part of the belt stars. So when you look at the belt stars, you'll have Analtak, Analam, which is the middle one, and then Metaka, which is the smallest of, of the three. And Metaka was actually the highest vibrational star system in the whole Orion constellation. Um, and the reason for that is because they were they were considered to be the sister star system to Arcturus. So there was this long relationship between Arcturus and Mintaka. And so they were trying, they were using Mintaka as kind of a energetic uh, highway, part of the energetic highway between Arcturus and the Orion Nebula beings, which were the Orion Light Council. So um so Mintaka was holding these really high frequencies. And so uh, the, the people that lived in Mintaka, there was, a, again, like a melting pot. So there's some, a lot of them were humanoid, but they had, you know, amphibian beings, reptilian beings, they had a lot of different types of beings that lived there. They were mostly of the positive polarity. And uh, the one thing that came across to me was just how resourceful these people were. I mean, Sometimes uh, resources were scarce in Orion, and uh, they were they learned to repurpose a lot of things. So what you see with a lot of Mintonkin star seeds is that they love to do crafts. They love to take junk and make it into something useful. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're or they take you know their furniture uh, refurnish furnishing people, or I don't know. They do. They do a number of different things where they like to take things and repurpose them because that's what they did a lot in Mintaka. Mintaka was a water planet, so it had a lot of um, amphibian and uh, aquatic beings that lived there. Um, in my memories of Mintaka, I saw golden skies, so they didn't have blue skies like we had here on Earth. It was like golden amber skies and beautiful uh, ocean, you know, it's like uh, the oceans just would reflect these golden skies. It was just so beautiful there. And, uh, and they did have quite a few, amphi you know, amphibian and uh, uh, aquatic beings. So a lot of Mintonkins uh, feel very connected to water. So I see a lot of these star seeds that want to live near water or they feel connection with water. Maybe they feel a special connection with a um with with dolphins or whales um because they had those beings also in mintaka mintaka also became uh the galactic one of the galactic federation headquarters in orion during the time when the galactic federation were assisting the belt star people in their sovereignty against the orion empire so um uh so there was a galactic federation presence um there and that's why as an Arcturian, I was there because I was working a mission there. But um, but yeah, it's a fascinating star system. And these uh, people are very community and family oriented. So um, maybe similar to um, Hadarians perhaps, but um, they are very community oriented. Uh, they are usually tend to be uh, very, very much involved with social justice, you know, where they just want to see equality for all, you know, um, because they dealt with so much inequality in their system in Orion. So, um, so yeah, we do have some amazing star people uh, with a varied history. And a lot of us, um, I think a lot of people when they first awaken and they're wondering what star system they're connected with, they have this misconception that, oh, I only come from one star system. But actually we all came, we all had incarnations in various different star systems. So it's not just, you know, oh, 
I'm a Pleiadian star seed, you know, you might have had a lot of lifetimes in the Pleiades, but maybe you also had some lifetimes in Aldebaran or Apollonia or some of the other systems. Um, Beautiful. So, yeah. I'm, so I'm going to, we have like six or seven more to go. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. We're, I'm here we'll as, as long as you need. So. Thank you. It's so comprehensive. I think people are going to love this. I want to ask you a personal question just to break it up a little bit here. Okay. So I know that in your story, Debbie, that you were a non-believer, you know, and if folks want to hear that, they can go back to my b -b 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 first um, interview with you. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, type Debbie Solaris in the search engine under my name, under YouTube or whatever channel you're on. Yeah. And so you're in the Navy, you're married to Terry. Terry is a total UFO enthusiast. And you're like, nah, you mm -hmm. didn't believe at all. Like me, I didn't believe at all either. And you know, when I woke, I woke. But what is it like now? Because here you are speaking at every conference, on television, on the radio. Like, you know, you've made this beautiful global business. And I'm sure that supersedes anything he could have dreamed of, but how is that for you, for him, for both of you now? I would say, uh, Terry and I talk about this a lot, just how much things have changed for us since 2012, mm -hmm. when I had that extraterrestrial contact experience. And honestly, we feel like uh, we're living our dream life right now, mm -hmm. where uh, we get to travel, we get to do different things, we get... Um, interactions with beautiful star seeds and people that we couldn't even imagine before my awakening. And uh, so I would say it, it almost seems comprehensible between my very, before I was awakened, it seemed like almost like it was a different life, you know, like it was um, like I was so asleep and I didn't, you know, I was just living this mundane human life. You know, I was just working, you know, for the health department and, you know, kind of schlepping along, paying, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, paying my bills when I can, paying taxes, you know, just having this normal, but yet boring life. And then after I've awakened, it was like, I mean, not that, that things were always easy, but because um, I certainly went through my challenges, but it's just uh, evolved to this point where I feel like I'm just living this dream fifth, fifth dimensional life, you know, where, uh, you know, all of a sudden people know who I am and, you know, I get to share, you know, uh, my information with, you know, uh, big groups of people at conferences. I get to be on the galactic cruise with you later this year and, um, and go to beautiful places. Uh, but yeah, it just seems comp and, and but we, a lot of times with what Terry and I would say, like, you know, wow, things have really changed for us, you know, even before, you know, since we first started dating and, uh, and it's just been, uh, a, a beautiful journey, I guess is how I would, uh, how I would describe it. I'm very happy for you both. I really am. That is so beautiful to be able to share that much with somebody who has the same values and interests as you do, and then include all these great people in our tribe, plus the travel, plus the notoriety, and the fact that you keep getting this fantastic information as it's asked of you. It's like, you know, how much good you're doing also. Thank you. Life. Thank you, Debbie. And I'm, I'm honored to share this journey with you as well. So uh, I know we're, uh, this is not, isn't going to be the last time we'll be together. We have the Starseed conference coming up and then we have the galactic cruise and, and then I don't know, maybe conscious life next year. I don't know. It's yeah. just a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I think uh, although our journeys are different in this space and mm -hmm. what we came here to do, some of what you're describing is has since last year just started happening for me. Yeah, gotcha. And in yeah. ways that have been a little bit breathtaking. Mm -hmm. And I have literally not submitted myself for anything. Mm -hmm. And doors keep opening and invitations keep coming. And um, I actually did a session with somebody today, just like, because I have so many questions. 
Yeah. If you, you know, to, you know, please, why? <laughs> and, and a little more direction and a little more downloads, frankly, yeah, for me too, so I can keep up with all of this because I am a yes. I will play the part that my soul chose in this incarnation to be this piece of heaven here on earth for this really amazing time. And, you know, so I know I have a lot of help, a lot, a lot of help. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I did too, actually. I'm very fortunate to have uh, just a connection with the star, star seed family, you know, our, our spiritual family here on earth and just the amazing people that we get to interact with every day. Um, and I wish that for everybody. And I do, I do know it's possible for all of us, mm. you know, so. so come with us on the cruise. You yeah, have please to. do. Yeah, please. It's going to be a blast. I can't wait. Uh, or come to, come to San Diego and hang out with us at, um, in, uh, for the star seed conference. That's going to be amazing. Yeah. So Deb and I and some other, you know, brilliant people, like amazing people are going to be speaking specifically about what we're talking about. And I just yeah. find really fascinating. Okay. So let's go to Orion. So is there an indigenous Orion star seed or are they also an amalgam of different races that ended up in this constellation? An amalgam, I would say, uh, as far as the humanoids, um, so I do get, you know, some Orion star seeds that incarnated as humanoid, you know, so a lot of times their genetics originated from Vega or Sirius, um, but they might have had past lives on Orion as well, which also impacted them. Um, but sometimes you get somebody that has just had lifetimes in Orion, you know, and that was their origination point. Uh, I see that sometimes with Pleiadians and Syrians too, that, you know, maybe they didn't have prior lifetimes before that they had their, you know, their origination point in Orion. Um, it depends on with Orion, it depends on the star system that they mostly had their lives in. Um, so a Mintonkin star seed might be different from somebody that was a Rigel star seed, you know, so somebody that had a lot of lifetimes in Rigel might have different personality traits than somebody that was Mintonkin because their civilization was different. We see this sometimes even with some of the Pleiadian systems because like Orion, Pleiades com comprised of a lot of stars, you know, so each of these star systems had their own civilization. So it wasn't like, oh, all Pleiadians are the same, you know, um, and then no, not, they weren't all blonde Nordics either. They had quite a lot of variety in the Pleiades uh, humanoid groups. But um, um, for some reason, I think because uh, Billy Meyer, who first was channeling the Pleiadians or interacting with them, interacted with the Alcyon Pleiadians or the Talget Tigetan Pleiadians, those ones tend to be more of the Nordic types. But actually, when I looked in the records, they, they had quite a few different um, humanoid types. Um, so they didn't all look like, you know, uh, blonde Nordic people, <laughs> but, um, but uh, Orion was kind of like that too, where uh, it depended more on what system they were from uh, or what, or where they had their past lives in. So um, Rigelians tend to be more aggressive, you know, so they are a little bit more um, maybe business oriented. They do well in the corporate world Maybe they work in finance or some sort of more structured reality. Whereas Mintonkins, they're a little bit more, like I said, they like to do crafts. They're more creative. They are resourceful people, more friendly, more softer personality types, you know. So it really depends with the Orions. But um, uh, so I, I couldn't really say like there's one quality with Orion. Um, now, what I did see with Orion, uh, as far as their health conditions, is that um, if they're not really well aligned or they have a lot of healing that they still need to do uh, spiritually and emotionally, they do tend to lean more towards having heart conditions, you know, so, um, so they might struggle with, um, you know, various different heart issues. Um, I see this sometimes with some Syrian star seeds as well. Um, and um, a lot of it has to do with, I think, healing um, anger. 
um, because a lot of them were super angry because they were, um, you know, they were caught in constant wars and conflicts, you know, so once they heal the anger issues and it's mostly anger with, um, with, with Orions. Uh, so, um, once they heal that they tend to transcend, you know, some of their health issues as well. So, or at least be able to manage it. Okay. So therapy for anger, shadow work <laughs> and, uh, whatever trauma from being in all of these wars. Very important. Yeah, very important for them. Um, you mentioned creating. Really well with clearing work. Um, clearing so work? Guess, yeah, clearings, yeah. Uh, a lot of times when I was when I used to do Akasha clearings, I would do them for a lot of Orion star seeds. And wow, just a difference after they go through that. It's just like, I mean, it's like a big, burden is lifted from their shoulders because they finally get the opportunity to release these attachments that they might have to some past life stuff. Do they have particular jobs they tend to go to? Um, yeah, it's kind of across the board with Orion people, but I would say mostly corporate. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Corporate work. Yeah. They, they like structure and systems. Um, <laughs> That's yeah, oh, um, and Tonkins, I would see, would be the exception. But um, but yeah, most of the Orion folks, they tend to like, I don't know, s structure systems. Um, maybe they work in IT. Maybe they work in um, some sort of corporate environment. Uh, doesn't mean they always do that. I think once they become awakened, they move past that. But um but that seems to be, some of them end up in the military, you know, so there's that too. Hmm. Makes sense. And Pleiadians, you've said some about them throughout this. Is there anything you want to add to what a Pleiadian starseed might want to know about themselves that would help them with their mission and their purpose? What I find with a lot of Pleiadian starseeds is that, um, they tend to like balance in their life. So um, they're extremely empathic people. So they feel, when they go into a room, they feel everybody's feelings. Um, and they also wanna transmute any negative. So they're transmuters a lot of times. And uh, sometimes they get really overwhelmed with, you know, oh, feeling everybody's feelings and oh my, oh, I'm trying to transmute all these negative emotions. And so for them, setting boundaries is really, really important. You know, shielding and boundaries is super important for Pleiadians because they sometimes will unwillingly take on other people's stuff. Um, or the other thing, other quality I see with Pleiadian starseeds, um, I'm going to be teaching a a little webinar um, in the next couple of months. Uh, it's it's about um, starseed relationships, particularly twin flame and soulmate relationships. So, but one of the qualities I see with Pleiadians is sometimes before they become awakened or before they've done their inner healing, they might be attracted to narcissistic partners um, or they might you know, fall into a codependent situation where they're caretaking their partner rather than being in an equal partnership. Mm -hmm. um, and so they end up having, maybe having to learn some really hard lessons around, uh, um, you know, in interdependence rather than um, codependence, you know, but, um, and sometimes, you know, they might go through a divorce or a breakup and then they realize, you know what, I don't want to attract this anymore. Um, I want to have a healthy relationship. Um, and so then they'll attract healthier partners once they're willing to do that inner work. Um, Pleiadians also tend to deal with blood sugar issues. Uh, so um, more so than any other group of star seeds, what I saw with Pleiadians is Sometimes they tend to be pre-diabetic or diabetic or have hypoglycemia. Uh, yeah, hypo hypoglycemia. Yeah, exactly. Um, because they're they deal sometimes with um, when they're having an incarnation here on Earth. It's really hard for them because things are so harsh here, and things in the Pleiades 
they were so supported. They were so loved. They had lived in these loving communities. And then they come here on earth and everybody's really mean and <laughs> all these negative emotions. And, you know, so they have a hard time, I think, sometimes transmuting that. And so they, it might, you know, manifest itself in, as some sort of blood sugar issue. So, um, so that's what I see a lot with Pleiadians. Uh, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say it's across the board, but I would say that's a trend with, with some of them. Okay. And you mentioned earlier Polarians. Mm-hmm. Where are they from and what are Polarians all about? How would they identify themselves? Um, I, that's another starseed group I didn't see much of. I maybe did readings for one or two Polarian starseeds, but um, they're from Polaris, which Polaris is our North Star. So right now, our North, our Earth's North Star, our axis, North axis is aligned with Polaris. It used to be aligned a long, long time ago with Vega. And eventually, our North Star will get realigned with Vega. But what happened was after the Laran Wars, um, the Earth axis got aligned with Thuban, which is in Draco. It's one of the major stars of Draco. So that was probably during the time of the dinosaurs, or I don't know, it was, uh, um, we had some alignments with Draco. And then um, around the time of Christ, we became aligned with Polaris. Uh, Polarians tend to be um, people, I I think in some ways, um, I I wanna say they're very down to earth. They're kind of similar to, to villains. Pavilla is another system that I see sometimes pop up in Akashic readings. Um, uh, so Polarians tend to be very down to earth. You're um, just really ethical, very, um, uh, I would say grounded people. Um, but yet at the same time, they're very empathic. They're very sensitive. They're very concerned with animals. Um, they love animals. You get like the Larens that uh, I, was, I think also love animals, but they love plants. You know, um, uh, these uh, Polarians are, are very much, sometimes they go into doing animal activist type work or an, they're, they're animal rescuers, or maybe they work in the veterinary kind of business, but, um, but they tend to really lean towards helping animals. That's usually what their mission is. And sometimes they might be an animal communicator too. But um, uh, but yeah, they're they're an interesting group. But yet there's kind of a kind of a folksy quality to them, where they're just real down to earth, real easy to be around. Um, uh, it's kind of different from the Pleiadians, where the Pleiadians are really airy fairy and you know kind of like you know, <laughs> um, a love and light, or, you know, they're just not very grounded. These people are more grounded. Well, now we're going to move over into the reptilians. And I want to preface this because there is a there is a lot of information out there. And there are people who speak about them mm-hmm. in regards to some of the darkness that goes on on this planet. When I woke up and I was speaking to Arjun, a Yael, who is being channeled through Vidika Kulhoff from Amsterdam. And I remember saying a blanket statement that was very negative about what the reptilians were like, you mm-hmm. know, these terrible creatures and race. And Arjun, the Yael, immediately Mm -hmm. said to me, that is not so. Just like on your planet, there are good people and maybe not so good people. And like in any profession on your planet, there are ones who are great at it, not so ones who are not so great. So, I mean, I made a joke at the time that I should get a t-shirt that say reptilian lives matter. (laughs) (laughs) And I just, so I, I wanna preface this conversation because there are, reptilian star seeds here. And there are, like I have friends who know that they're reptilian priestesses. Mm -hmm. And there is, you know, the beautiful Rob Gauthier who channels many beings, actually hundreds of beings, but 
One of them happens to be Aridif, who, mm-hmm. oh, excuse me, Aridif is actually his Pleiadian, but he also, uh, it may be Treb, who he channels that is a yeah, reptilian. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so this is important uh, to understand that these are not a bad race. These are, so let, I'll let you take over yeah. from here. Um, it's funny because every time I post like a little video short on Instagram about where I'm talking about not all, not all Pleiadian, uh, not, 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 sorry, Pleiadians, I meant uh, all, not all reptilians are bad. There are some good ones. I get so much hate from the, the public, you know, I get like a lot of trolls and people saying real negative things, you know, because I'm just sharing a truth about the reptilians that they're not all evil. You know, there's a lot, I, I, I was fortunate enough to do readings for reptilian star seeds who were dragon cast beings, you know, they were dragons in their past lives and, and they they were teachers and they were healers. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so there, and then I also done readings for people who had reptilian guides who were benevolent reptilians who were, massive healers from Sirius or from Orion, you know, so they weren't necessarily all bad. And now it doesn't mean that there aren't some bad ones out there. There are definitely some negative reptilians. Um, so I don't want to make a blanket statement and say, oh yeah, they're all kind of fluffy. You know, they're not, they're, they're not, um, they're not always fluffy, but, and, and nice, but there are some reptilian star seeds who are actually, um, had past lives as dragon or maybe that was their origination was they were dragon cast beings and they chose to have a human incarnation in order to maybe heal some some of these this rift between the reptilians and humans um, and uh, so a lot of them come in um, I think I did a reading once for a dragon star seed who is a elementary school teacher you know that was what I mean, which to me seems like, okay, you know, that's different, you know, um, don't see the correlation there, but in a way I actually do see the correlation because they're trying to heal, you know, um, others of them were light, light language channelers or they were healers. Um, and so they're not necessarily always negative. Um, and I, I do, um, uh, and they're beautiful beings. I mean, they're extremely psychic. Uh, what I see with reptilian star seeds, just as a blanket statement, I guess, is that they're extremely psychic, even more so than your average star seed. They can pick up on information really fast. Um, it's like all their Claire's gifts are wide open. Okay. Um, and a lot of times they are very propathetic. They can read the future. Um, they have multi-dimensional aspects to them where they can travel between dimensions very easily. Uh, they, like the um, avians, uh, are frequency managers, you know, so they work with frequency quite a bit. Um, and so um, not all the reptilians are bad, you know, um, but yeah, are there bad ones here? Yeah. There are. Um, and uh, I, I think we see a lot of them in our governments, unfortunately, but um, and a lot of them in the royal families or some of the major, you know, one percenters or elites. Um, a lot of them have Anunnaki and reptilian genetics. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, so there are some negative factions um, here on planet Earth. But then at the, on the flip side, there's also uh, positive uh, reptilian beings who are trying to make a positive difference. And what about the draconians? Again, blanket statement like, woof, you know, warmongering, uh, out for themselves, narcissistic, uh, you know, not to be messed with, and all of that, because there is some of that energy, that dark energy also on Earth. But is it a blanket statement that they are all like this? And I'm super curious. I have a new friend, never would have thought I would make a friend like this, but God bless him because he is a reptilian in this and incarnated into earth, representing Mm -hmm. a faction of draconians. And he's one of the most magnetic, charming, fascinating, interesting people I've met. I really like this guy. 
I mean, we text and stuff and yeah. you, you know, so I'm curious about that because I don't know what, who they are in total. Yeah. I would say there's probably some, even some warrior cast reptilians. They're also going through their own evolution where some of them are turning to the light and they're trying to heal this rift between, you know, humanoid races and the reptilians, which was creative way back in, you know, the Lyra days during the wars. Um, and I've encountered these individuals as well. I think I met one of them at uh, Conscious Life, but um, but yeah, they tend to be very charming. They're very well spoken. They're not brutish by any means or uh, or crude. You know, they um, but they'll tell you the truth. You know, <laughs> they'll say like, you know, I don't I don't agree with you, or uh, that's not my version of the story. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, and sometimes they can be quite aggressive um in sharing you know their truth but i think they're doing it for the higher good you know so but just like other reptilian beings and other even other humans or humanoid groups they're also evolving and some of them are turning into the light um i wouldn't say that's a hundred percent of them maybe it's a very small percentage of them but um, there are some of them that have decided that they want to be part of the positive polarity. So, uh, so yeah, I'm not really surprised to hear that at all. Um, okay. Very interesting stuff and very good for us, you know, because we're, we can heal the rift, the separation, you know, and, and bring others into this unity um, because we are them, they are us. This is good. This is very good. Uh, Syrians. So I know this is one of the very popular. Yeah, star popular star groups. Star seed. What yeah. are their characteristics? So Syrians, if you look at their history, uh, they were, there, there are some indigenous beings that lived in Syria. So like Orion, there was uh, some diversity in Syria. Um, but if we're talking about Sirius A, um, a lot of Syrians from Sirius A were descendants of Laran and Vagan refugees. So when those beings escaped the wars um, and started colonizing Sirius, uh, they ended up intermarrying and intermixing with each other. Um, so that's why, you know, when we see Syrians depicted, they have a light blue skin tone because you had the Vega people that were deep blue skin, and then you had the white Larans, and they were kind of a mix between those two races. And there was also quite a few lion and feline beings that lived in Sirius that were also descendants of the Laran lion and feline beings. Uh, so on Sirius A, you saw mostly humanoids and 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 uh, and felines, and then in Sirius B, you were seeing most of the aquatic beings that lived in Sirius B. Uh, as far as their characteristics, if you're talking about Sirius A in particular, these people were really practical, okay? They were very divine feminine oriented, mm -hmm. but because they came from a mother goddess consciousness of uh, civilization, these folks were uh, practical people. So they knew that, you know what? We live in a physical reality. We have to do physical things, you know, <laughs> in order to live in this reality. But at the same time, they were highly spiritual, you know, so um, so these folks were healers. They were, uh, you know, they were astrologers. They were, you know, uh, they, you know, a lot of these modalities that we currently use today here on Earth, such as astrology, numerology, crystal healing, Reiki, you know, all these modalities, you know, plant medicine, ayahuasca, you know, cannabis all came from Sirius, you know, so they had a huge impact on our civilization here on earth. And these, uh, these Syrian people were just amazing. Um, uh, but a lot of them were practical. So they knew that, you know what, we have to create a physical reality, we have to create structure, we have to create systems, you know, so, um, so they do tend to be, um, sometimes focused on that until they awaken and then they're like, okay, now I'm ready to do the more spiritual work. What the trend I saw with Syrian star seeds is a lot of them go into medicine. 
mm-hmm. because their big focus is they want to be of service to others. Um, and so, and they are considered to be the masters of physical healing. So that was their contri- contribution to healing. Um, so a lot of them end up becoming nurses and doctors is what I see until they have their great awakening. And then they're like, you know what? Maybe they still stay in the medical field, but they might decide to have a more holistic view of medicine or they get out of it altogether and do something healing oriented that's more alternative. Based on your description, I was curious, are a lot of the shamans on this planet originally from Sirius or is it from another planet system? Um, I would say shamans, I would say some of them came from Sirius. Uh, some of them actually came from Merope and Maya in the Pleiades. So uh, the Pleiadians too also had, you know, their systems that were really focused on healing. Um, so that, so um, a lot of times with shamans, I think, um, depending on their star system orientation, uh some shamans are really focused on physical healing. They that might be more the Syrian group, and then you have the shamans that are into light activation, or or they're doing a lot of shadow work. They might be more the Pleiadian varieties. Very interesting. And what about Mayan people? Because I understand that they descend from some other star system, and you know Adam Apollo was talking about that. It was really interesting because I have had a strong past life as a Mayan, uh, incarnated as a Mayan, but from another galaxy and extremely tall, like seven Mm. feet and more tall. Interesting. Um, Mayans are aligned with, I would say the two major systems they're aligned with is the Pleiades and also uh, Venus. Um, If you notice, like a lot of, um, I went to Chichen Itza a couple of years ago and noticed that, oh, all these, um, all these temples are aligned with the Pleiades or with Venus. Why is that? Because that's where they came from, you know? So, um, but I actually think their, their civilization even had influences even beyond this galaxy. So I think there was probably, it went even beyond the Pleiades or even beyond Venus. Um, uh, but I think maybe uh, what probably happened was that there was actually a lot of uh, indigenous humanoid beings that lived in the Pleiades that originated maybe from some other galaxy or some other reality. Um, mm-hmm. And then they intermixed and intermarried with the, the, the Pleiadians that were more the descendants of Lyrans, you know, so they, there was also a mix in the Pleiades, but, um, uh, but a lot of the, um, Mayan uh, culture actually had a heavy influence from Maya, which is a star system in the Pleiades that was very divine, feminine oriented, very spiritually oriented system. Um, Our concepts of shamanism actually originated from Maya and Merope, which is two systems in the Pleiades. Beautiful, wow. Okay, two more to go. Okay. this situation, because I know in the beginning you said there's about 22 star seed groups. So we're not going to do all 22, but we're hitting some major, major ones here. Yeah, we're um, some, even some not so well known ones, which I think will be really interesting for people to hear about. I agree. Yeah, yeah it's so much out there. Um, vegan. So, yeah, can you describe the vegan star seeds? and how they are unique from all of what we've talked about before and what they're doing here on earth, why they came. With vegans, um, and I, I've done the readings for a lot of people that have had origination from Vega or they've had lifetimes in Vega. Vegans were more the humanoid representation of mother goddess consciousness. So these people, um, and you might see some correlations between the Vagan civilization and Sirius because the Vagan civilization actually influenced Sirius. So the Syrians took their civilization and kind of ran with it, but it was originated from Vega. Um, But Vagan people were blue skinned. Um, I always, when I see them, in the records, they looked very similar to the Hindu gods. You know, they had, they were just beautiful people, 
very beautiful beings. Uh, and uh, they too had a practical side to them. So despite, um, even though they were very focused on healing, so a lot of our concepts of Ayurvedic medicine actually originated from Vega. So Ayurvedic medicine didn't or just originated from India here on planet earth for thousands of years. It actually originated beyond India from Vega because there was vegan um, colonies in India, you know, so, um, and so they were the ones that first came up with the concept of using plants for medicine, which was then expanded upon in Sirius. Um, so um, vegan star seeds have a softer personality or a more gentler personality than say a Laren. Um, Larens tend to be more father God consciousness oriented. They're more physical. They're more um, action oriented people. Vegans are more receptive. They, um, they're, they're more reactive rather than, oh, I'm gonna you know, push forward and do something. Um, but at the same time, they did have very advanced star starships and technology in their system. So like I said, there was this practical side to them as well. Um, as far, to answer your question about what are they here to do, um, I think similar to the Larens, they're probably here to uh, help bridge the gap between um, uh, technology and spirituality. So... Uh, a lot of what I see a lot of vegans do is that they might be working in a corporate job for a time and then they decide, you know what, I'm going to bring some concepts into my corporate job that are more spiritually oriented. Either that or they tend to be plant healers or energy healers. I see that a lot too with these vegan people. Um, but I do see a fair number of them that do work in the corporate world, but then they're like, you know what? I'm going to either leave that that world and do something highly spiritual, or I'm going to end up um, integrating some spiritual concepts into this corporate um, environment that I'm in to transcend it from the inside out. Um, so uh, that's the trends I usually see with vegans. Okay. And you have mentioned now a couple of times with the various star seeds, mother goddess consciousness. Mm -hmm. And part of the healing, from what I understand on this planet right now, is the rise of the divine feminine, because mm -hmm. we have existed until now in a very industrial way of being, very active, very being, very masculine, very, uh, you know, very pushing our way through everything. Yeah, and hate. now to bring back, which where we once were, divine feminine, and then that got pushed down, but now to bring everything back into balance so that we live more in receiving and in love and in harmony and so forth. So when you talk about this mother goddess consciousness, are these star seeds also here to help create that balance to usher that in? Absolutely. Yep. Um, I see that a lot with Larens and Vagans um, that where they're integrating more of the divine feminine aspects, Syrians and, uh, also, uh, Syrians also are here to bring in more of the divine feminine aspects because they did uh, primarily have a divine feminine civilization. Uh, so we do see uh, star seeds that that's their main mission here is to integrate more of this divine feminine uh, energy on this planet so that there is more of a balance. It's not so heavily patriarchal like it's been for the last few thousand years on this planet where it's like oh my gosh it's it's like toxic max masculinity you know it's like we need some you know female energy here you know so um and i do see, think this is represented even astronomically um there is a asteroid called sedna who is part of our solar system but she has a very elliptical like a very long elliptical orbit and for many, many uh, thousands of years, uh, Sedna was way, way out beyond our solar system. Now she's starting to come back into our solar system back towards Earth. So this is a representation of the divine feminine. And if you don't know the story of Sedna, 
Sedna is actually an Inuit goddess who is the goddess of the sea. And uh, she was, I think, um, uh, pretty much bullied and um, treated very badly by her father and by her husband. And then she went through this massive transformation. She fell into the sea and became the Inuit goddess of the sea. And so this represents, you know, very beautifully the story of the divine feminine, you know, coming into empowerment. Um, so Sedna is actually the astronomical representation of the divine feminine coming back into our reality and becoming more and more empowered. Um, so uh, yeah, you guys might want to do a little deep dive into the whole um, uh, mythology of Sedna and just how fascinating that story is. That's beautiful. And that totally coincides with a shaman prophecy out of Peru called the Pachacuti. And part of the Pachacuti that we are in right now, which literally translates to time of change, time of mm -hmm. making things right. Exactly. which we're right heading towards right now. And mm -hmm. one of them, there's several aspects to it, but one of them is that the balance, the now balance of masculine feminine, and, you know, to be very clear, that is one both ways of great respect, great reverence, great love, great upholding. So the masculine can become the protector, which doesn't mean we can't defend ourselves. It has nothing to do with that, but it's really allowing those natural roles to come and evolve and the great empowerment of the feminine to oh, rise absolutely. for us to do what we came here to do and be honored and revered by the men. So yeah. ah, it's going to be so good. <laughs> oh, it's going to be great. Yeah. I can't wait for that to happen. Uh, I think it is happening as we speak, but it's been very slow going, but um, we'll, we'll see what happens in the next decade or so. Um, and uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean we're totally wiping out the divine masculine. You know, there is there does need to be that balance. You know, there's not like, oh, we want to just totally eradicate the guys or the, the I mean, we want to honor them and help them to step into their true role, which is to be protectors and um, and healers and and, you know, have these beautiful uh, you know, role of being fathers and brothers and, you know, taking care of things, you know, so, uh, which is what men were always supposed to be. So uh, exactly, you know, and more and more, there are men's groups coming up and mm -hmm. not for therapy, but yeah. in order for men to step into their divine aspect to fully oh, be oh. who they are. And it's so healing. It's so healing both ways. So okay. agreed not to wipe out, to really honor and cherish really yeah, totally. and make room for the feminine as well. Feminine as well. Yeah, totally. So finally, drum roll. Okay. We have from Venus, the love planet, we have the Venusian star seeds. So tell us about the Venusians, Debbie. What are their characteristics? What is their purpose? What is their mission? Uh, let's see. Uh, Venusians. I, I had the great fortune to interact with Venusian uh, star seeds with, you know, with through the many readings I've done. Um, uh, like, like maybe similar to the Hadarians, they tend to be very feminine oriented. Um, and, uh, what we see with Venusians is that their civilization was heavily, uh, influenced by the Hathors, which the Hathors were the very divine feminine, kind of an avian group of feminine beings that originated uh, from Sirius and maybe even beyond Sirius, but um, uh, but there's this, they tend to be, um, I would say, uh, but, but uh, different than the Hadarians. Hadarians are very emotional. Uh, Venusians tend to be very sharp-minded people. I mean, they're, they are very um, aware of what's going on. They um, it's not that like they let their emotions take over them. So they kind of represent more of the divine feminine uh, strength and uh, empowerment aspects, which is definitely, um, I would say, an offshoot of their Hathorian connections. But, um, but a lot of times uh, they do tend to work in uh, sometimes technical fields, um, 
But a lot of times what they end up doing is they bring very divine feminine aspects to these fields, uh, more so than maybe even the vegans or, you know, other, other groups. Um, um, Venusians did interact with our government. Um, these are the Venusian Venusians, not the star seeds, but the Venusians actually interacted with our government back in the 1950s. So they were trying to, um, to, in, to create a treaty with our governments, but the, our governments were only interested in weaponized technology, not technology that was actually, actually gonna help people. So the Venusians wanted no part of that and they backed out. And then our government, particularly the um, US government ended up making treaties with uh, gray alien Zeta reticuli beings. So, uh, um, so they have tried in the past to um, intervene and interact with us. Um, um, and so now I think what we're seeing more of is Venusian star seeds that are trying to heal things from the inside out. So they're trying to have an impact on our systems, you know, and, and bringing in the feminine element that way. Powerful, Debbie. Oh, my. Thank you. Thank you for your extreme you. generosity in this. Yeah. So you and I are going to be presenting on the Celebrity Cruise Line, which is like the ultimate luxury cruise line. And we're going I've to- some... Equinox. It's, it's a huge ship. It's beautiful. It's got all the amenities. Yeah. So, yeah. Tell us what you're going to be speaking about in your presentations or present, or if you're only doing one. Um, well, uh, since the whole theme is galactic uh, origins, um, I think it's called the galactic origins cruise. That's what I'm going to be talking about is galactic origins. So, uh, um, and I'm going to bring in some of the star seed components, but it's going to be a lot of history and a lot of how that interacts with us today and how that influences us. Beautiful. And I just want to tell folks, I have another question for Deb, but the Galactic Origins Cruise, December 14th through the 24th, I think it's actually the 21st, the 21st, not the 24th. Yeah, it's the 21st. Yeah, it's a week, it's a week cruise. So a seven day cruise. Yeah. You like get your get your cabin before they sell out because yeah. I know they're closing it off in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Um, and you just want to get in there. I know there's people have expressed interest. You're going to be exploring the wonders of the Yucatan alongside me, alongside the amazing Debbie Solaris and some of the other galactic and spiritual presenters on this seven day celebrity cruise are Jerry Sargent, Sarah Breskman Cosme, Laura Eisenhower, J.J. Hurtak, J.K. Ultra, Vivian Chavez, Lori Spagna. I mean, this is so amazing. Alan yeah. Seinfeld, Neil Gar, and so many more. Just say yes to this phenomenal cruise with great presentations, land excursions to Belize, Honduras, and Mexico, and beautiful days at sea. And believe it or not, when you get a friend or a lover or whatever to sign up with you, when you cruise with them, you get a special discount. And you're going to see uh, at galacticoriginscruise.com more information about this phenomenal experience. We'll also have it in the show notes. And uh, Debbie, this is Dare to Dream. Usually I would ask you, what are you next Dare to Dream? But here's what I want to ask you. What, and truthfully, what have you not created yet? What is so important to you on your bucket list that you've not lived into yet, but before you go, you want so much to have this experience? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I would say there's, I would like to see everybody be able to um, meet their highest potential. Um, that's on a more, I would say, collective level. Um, I do believe that we are all able to create a fifth dimensional, um, a real, fifth dimensional reality here on earth even now. Um, so, you know, uh, just open yourself up to that, you know, disconnect yourself from the matrix. Personally, what I would say is I would love to have a show on Gaia TV. I think it's time. I think it's time. Um, so, um, you know, hopefully that manifests. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But um, but I like to have a bigger outreach um, to the, the mass consciousness and uh, get more people um, connected with their galactic origins and with their divine aspects of themselves. So, uh, 
So I would say that's um, my twofold answer. <laughs> so thank Those you. are very generous to all of us, your dreams. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. And again, folks, if you want to find more about her, go to Debbie Solaris dot com. Join us on the cruise. Sign up for my shaman class that's about to open. Please go to Gaia TV if you want to watch more. There's tons, <laughs> not just with George, but with Regina Meredith for Debbie Solaris. Uh, she's really a frequent guest there. And also my inaugural interview with George Nori on Beyond. Won't be the last one. I can guarantee you that. So they'll, they'll have you back. But uh, and I'm also on Deep Space uh, last season. So if you want to check I that saw out. you. I watched the series. Yes. And I was so excited to see you there. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, so, yeah, I hope uh, I'm sure. Uh, and then I'm going to have a show that's going to be, uh, I think, uh, airing i think in another month or so um on elementals you know so if you love fairies and uh little people then that would and mermaids that would be the show for you so <laughs> okay great and elementals is on gaia tv yeah that's going to be uh on beyond belief with george but um that'll be airing soon yeah beautiful oh my goodness book ended by the debbies so definitely there's so much for you to deep dive again i'll have a link to gaia if you have a subscription just go enjoy it if you don't i'm going to give you one for a free 14-day trial so you can go have some fun there and i end today's experience with a quote from actor tony hale fear is what you see anxiety is what you don't see with anxiety you can stop your mind from going into what if, what if. Choose instead to live in the present and the reality of your now. Sometimes fear is just trying to protect you and it's your choice what to do with it. You can have compassion with it and say, hey, I appreciate you being here. I know you're trying to help. Just observe things rather than drowning in it. And remember, that anxiety is excitement without the breath. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashinger. Next week on the show, my guest is Dee Wallace, American actress. You know her from playing Mary Taylor in the 1982 blockbuster film, E.T., the extraterrestrial, she was the mom. And Dee began her channeled healing work over 20 years ago when she dropped to her knees after her husband's sudden death and asked for a way that we can heal ourselves. After that, she became a very powerful healer and seer. Thank you so much for joining us today. Remember from whence you came and tap into that energy, those characteristics, do the healing work for that starseed race. And know you came here at this very auspicious time for just such great reason. We really need you to create all of our dreams into a dream earth and a dream humanity. Thank you for joining us.